Hello and welcome back to Quality Policing. I am Peter Moskos, and I'm really pleased to be here today with Michael Fortner. Um, Michael is an assistant professor of political science at CUNY's Graduate Center. CUNY is part is the umbrella university um, that I'm a part of at John Jay College. It's the City University of New York. Um, he's also a senior fellow at the Niskanen Center, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, received a BA in political science and African American studies from Emory University and a PhD in government and social policy from Harvard. What what year did you get your PhD? 2010. 2010. Okay. So six years uh, behind me, I guess, but we were in different departments. Um, Michael is also a contributor to uh, my violence reduction project, which is a collection of essays on bringing down violence um, after last year's unprecedented historic rise. Uh, those essays and this podcast can be found at qualitypolicing.com. And we're also being joined by another uh, special, a special host, um, Leon Taylor, which so, some of you may remember as the uh, former co-host of this podcast. Welcome, Leon. Hello. All right. Um, so, Michael, let me start by um, asking you a question. Um, what inspired you uh, to, to write the essay you did? Maybe you can just give a brief uh, sort of plot summary of it. It's titled From Protest to Problems, The Minneapolis Story. Right. So first, thank you for having me. Um, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. Um, and I have a ton of questions for you. But first, let me talk about the piece that I wrote for you. I've been struck by the simplicity of the narrative in elite media um, when it comes to police brutality in the United States and the ways in which it is so tethered to the slavery, new Jim Crow um, argument. And my work has been, you know, in the complexity of the matter, looking at the role that working in middle-class African-Americans have played in the rise of mass incarceration, mass incarceration, showing how their push for greater public safety in New York during the late 1960s and early 1970s caused them to turn to police and prisons for solutions, whether right or wrong, that's what they did. And I've always felt that that part of the story, um, you know, hasn't been sufficiently told. And then to have this racial awakening, um, you know, over police and, and still not have the complexity of that story, um, there really um, bothered me, annoyed me. And so I wanted to write a piece focused on Minneapolis, where it happened, where George, George Floyd was murdered, where the conflagration began, um, to see what went on. I mean, and, and how people there, particularly um, Black folks on the ground, um, interpreted those events. And the argument in, in the piece is that, you know, drawing from some of the public policy literature is that the, we know that there are simple and complex causal stories in the policy formation process. And the literature suggests that, you know, simple causal stories that links um, some kind of origin and some kind of outcome um, are sort of easier to deal with politically. People understand them. You could easily sort of mobilize um, sort of policy support around them. That that sort of simple narrative, right, in this case, wasn't really working as effectively on the ground in Minneapolis. That, in fact... Um, African-Americans in the city had begun to embrace a more complex story, that they understood their situation as being both a, about over-policing of their communities, the ways in which um, they might be subject to state violence, and under protection, the ways in which they are also subject to um, you know, violence, subject to crime, and that that part of the narrative their own story was completely missing. And the product of that is that sort of the Minneapolis politicians in the end were caught off guard because they started this journey by claiming to, by uh, promising to d dismantle the police. Um, and then by the end of the year, they couldn't do it. And they couldn't do it because um, of lack of public support. 
over 60%, I mean, around 49% of African-Americans in, in Minneapolis thought cutting the number of police officers would have a negative you know, outcome. Um, over 60% of African-Americans over 50 believe that. And that kind of desire for more policing, not less policing, made it very difficult for the politicians in Minneapolis to actually dismantle po the police. And in fact, many of them themselves eventually called for more policing to deal with the uptick in violent crime. And so I wrote the piece again to emphasize that we, we really need to beware of the simple, alluring um, causal story that roots, that links our current problems back to slavery and misses the nuances of the policing and crime situations in many Black neighborhoods. Hmm. And do you think that the defund movement is, do people not understand or do they not care? And do you think it's disproportionately white? I, so I, I think, so a couple of things. I think one, there's a generational divide that there are um, young people of color who are, um, who are overwhelmingly in support of, of defund the police. I think part of that um, might be their own experience with policing. That's very different from um, the experience that older African-Americans have had over the past two decades. Um, they also have never lived in the, the, the sort of the crime highs of the early 1990s. And so they don't know what, uh, you know, intense crime um, actually feels like. And so I think that they're informing the discourse um, to a large degree. And a lot of white political elites, intellectual elites, are sort of uncritically taking that narrative as being the only narrative. And what I'm suggesting is that that narrative isn't sort of wrong or right. It's part of it, right? That, the, that we, we need to take seriously complaints about police brutality, the extent to which there may be over-policing in these communities. But there is another story there where there are other people who, in these communities, whose qualm with police is that they're not there when they need them, <laughs> that they want police to be more effective in producing more public safety. And I think if we have both of those narratives on the table, um, I think we could have a more fruitful policy conversation. But I think a, a lot of white intellectual and political elites um, are unfamiliar with a part of that story, the, the story that's sort of pro-policing in Black neighborhoods. And so they easily dismiss it. Hmm. The, the whole over-policing, under-policing uh, concept, which I think there's a fundamental truth to it. I mean, the idea that people want more policing and better policing, we right. can call that nuanced. It's not that complicated. Fair enough. Like, it shouldn't be hard to grasp. Um, the over police it's almost become a cliche, though. I think it got popularized um, from ghetto side, though I might be yeah. wrong about that. That's right. But That's it right. seems That's to be right. when it sort of gained traction. Um, how, do you see... Can can you break it down a bit? What what does that when people use that phrase? What are they what are they trying to get at, or what are they not getting at? So I think they're getting at, and again, it 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 um it is not that complicated um, for people who are in the communities, but it is complicated um, when you put it next to the more simple narrative that everything is about slavery, right? And 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 that narrative says that. Um, well, there's sort of two main features of it. One is that policing is embedded within the history of, of slavery and racism. And they sort of talk about police, um, uh, slave patrols and their link to modern policing. Um, and they Can sort of I say, stop you there? Because that's yeah. such a pet peeve of mine. I know, um, I know. What, wh what is that link? And why do, how do I, well, I know partly because it was a New Yorker article that right. basically asserted it. Right. Um, I'm going to say there's no, as at least in the, in the South, it's a right. little more debatable and messy because the police became agents of, of, you know, legal Jim Crow racial segregation. They were part of that system undoubtedly and intertwined with it. Um, I'm going to say there's absolutely no link between slave patrols and police and the new police in the North, um, unless one is purely talking about uh, white supremacist structure and police being part of it. I mean, in that sense, everything's part of it. But there is a very distinct creation of policing right. in America right. Right. Uh, from the London right. 1829 model. Right. Right. Um, it was called the new police. And they, they weren't slave catchers, damn it. And, right. and I think that's an important, right. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, right. that's an right. important distinction because right. if you say police come from slave catching, you're saying it's an inherently bad institution. Right. And right. then maybe we should abolish it and start new. If you're right. saying policing were invented uh, somewhat in opposition to that even, um, 
and it's a noble idea that has been flawed, but it, you know, it gets to the fundamental nature of whether police as a concept uh, is good or bad. So that's that's why I <laughs> that's why I talk about that. No, thank you for that. But but but, but 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 that is that argument has been all I've read over the last <laughs> year um, everywhere in a lot of elite publications. It's just um, said now as a fact. Right, and yet right, there's been a fair right, amount written about police history right, before these other people cared about it. Right. It's, it's not a mysterious history. You know, the newspaper right, articles talked right, about it at the time. Right. Um, you know, I went back and it's a little hard to disprove something. I went to Frederick Douglass's newspapers in Rochester mm -hmm. um, and I may have missed it, but, you know, I searched. It's all there in the Library of Congress database. I was like, what does he say about the start of police? Right, right. Just curious. Right. Um, he says nothing. Occasionally mm -hmm. he refers to police like, you know, it's not that they didn't exist because they also started in Rochester, I think, in the 1850s. Um, it wasn't a big deal to him. And I just I find that interesting. You did not say this is the this, you know, th this is the South spreading its slavery tentacles in, in, into New York State. So right. I don't know. But you know. right. But but so but, but the, the, the other part um, and uh, uh, the second um, element of this argument and you can sort of take takes this part as, as soon as I outline it, um, is sort of the new Jim Crow part uh, that sort of sees modern policing and mass incarceration as a response to the, the, the civil rights victories of the 1960s, right? And, and the argument being that there is this unrelenting racial order um, that will not be sort of uh, deterred in um, the United States. And as you have um, African-Americans achieving uh, meaningful progress, you need a new system of social control. Um, and this new system of social control is policing in prisons. Um, and they come about in this particular moment. Um, and they sort of reference Nixon and Reagan and, and now Clinton um, to and, talk and about- Foucault. And, and Foucault, right. Um, to, to talk about the ways in which um, sort of racial power is reproduced um, in police and prisons. Again, that, um, that argument, I think, captures to some extent um, or speaks to um, what a lot of people in urban centers did experience in terms of police brutality. I think it it is true that there, there, there were instances in a lot of these urban centers, um, you know, throughout the 20th century um, of police brutality. Um, there were also instances of police not being there, um, which is also what people complained about, of not sort of having police around and not having e enough policing. And so part of what I've been trying to do in my work is to sort of complicate the history and sort of to tell this dual story that focuses on um, both, you know, those moments when um, there are clear instances of state violence, those moments when, um, you know, police are um, discourteous to African-Americans. I mean, one of the main complaints, if you look at surveys from the 1960s about police, is not that they beat up people um, necessarily, it's that they're rude and they're nasty and they curse at you. Um, and, and it's not necessarily, you know, that they sort of rough you up, although that does show up in, in some, of the, some of the surveys. Um, but their biggest complaint is that they're never around. Um, and that they want more of them to be around to deal with a lot of the crime problems that they were experiencing in cities. Um, and so I think that is the the um, the meaning of over policing and, and under protection. Um, you know, the condition um, in which urban communities face a lack of policing as a public good. Um, and then when they do get it, it feels as if um, it is too punitive, too rough, too discourteous. Leon, let me bring you into this. What are your thoughts? Um, so Leon, uh, to sort of reintroduce him, he, he's East Baltimore born uh, and also a uh, Air Force MP and then Baltimore City police officer. We don't actually know each other from that time. Um, we became friends later. Um, but um, Leon in particular wanted to join this interview and I'm happy to have you back here, Leon. Your thoughts. Thank you. No, it's, uh, it is interesting. And, and what I find is that um, the uninformed tend to simplify the situation. Um, and it's a case of you know, uh, creating a solution for a problem that doesn't exist. I think what's needed is to have equity in policing. Um, and that is to say that uh, those people that came to Baltimore during the, you know, in, in the summer of 2015 for Freddie Gray, right? They were heavily abolitionists, police abolitionists, but they could afford to be because 
they didn't have rampant crime in their neighborhoods. So, yes, they were very vocal and they were very adamant about, you know, uh, controlling the police and the way that everything was scrutinized. Prisoner transport was scrutinized. The wagons, I think uh, you wrote a piece also about how that could be improved. Um, the situation that central booking in Baltimore, for instance, um, you know, those practically inhumane conditions. Um, so all these things came into play, but I think the one thing that's a, a standard, that's, that's a standard across the board is that people want policing. They want decent policing. I want the same standard of policing for the Eastern District in Baltimore than that, uh, you know, um, I don't know, anyone else has in the state. I want that good policing. I want to be addressed respectfully. I want uh, police to respond in a timely manner. I want my family protected. But at the same time, I don't expect to be over-policed. And how do you then police a violent neighborhood without over-policing? Isn't that the dilemma? You need people that understand the community. Um, one of the things that I found out um, from talking to other uh, former officers is our selection process was slightly different than I, I believe yours was. I dare say that the uh, polygraph operator didn't stop the polygraph test when you told him that you didn't smoke marijuana. That I seemed lying, to by be... By the way, I have <laughs> to point out. <laughs> Well, I'm just saying, you know, we, we talk about uh, the reception of, uh, you know, black officers in the community. And there are things that we go through simply to be on the street that you weren't privy to. A certain scrutiny, if you will. Um, but what's what's needed, what's desperately needed is police that understand the reason behind the criminal activity and that. They don't indict, you know, I think this uh, old term, indicting a corner, okay? They don't indict mm. the whole neighborhood. Mm. And that is to say, mm. um, see the entire neighborhood and all the residents to criminal activity because it makes it easy. It makes it very easy. You don't have to think. You know, the, the issue that you're bringing up, Michael, is that this is not a simple problem with the easy solution. Defund the police. Sounds great. Gets everybody excited. Yes, we'll do this. Okay, now what are we going to do about all these homicides? What are we going to do about a Baltimore city where you've had an additional 100 uh, citizens, victims of homicide since Freddie Gray? You know, every no one year, talks about every that. year. You know, no no one talks about that. You know, there's no marches. There's no there's there's nothing. It just those people, I guess, don't fit the narrative, so they're not important. So I think this is a critical point. Um, for me, a and that is in the scholarship on this for a long time, um, crime didn't matter uh, to, to crime policy formation. In fact, there was sort of an argument that there was sort of no relationship at all between crime and crime policy. Of course, crime sets an important context for crime policy making, um, even though there may not be a direct sort of causal relationship to the particulars of crime policy making. And I think that's been incorporated into the, the broader public discourse about this. And that is it, crime isn't the issue. Social control is the issue. And I think you 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 can focus on the social control dynamic only if you sort of dismiss all of the lives that are lost to homicide. You can sort of dismiss the, you know, the the sort of the social, I mean, the other issues that people might bring up, right, um, about policing, if you just sort of completely ignore the experience um, that people in these communities actually deal with. What, what I like to say, what crime feels like um, is completely missing from this conversation. I grew up in Brownsville, Brooklyn at the height of the crack epidemic, right? And, you know, crime was real for me. Um, I know what it felt like to hear gunshots at night. Um, I know what it felt like to, you know, walk and over crack vials, right? Um, like, what does that 
feel like I think it's completely missing from the conversation um, over policing because people think that crime really isn't the problem and that if we sort of get rid of policing, um, all these other solutions will solve themselves. And that's an interesting empirical question um, that I'm not sure people in those communities actually want to test. And so one of the things that I'm um, really struck by, and, and, and Peter, this is my question for you, is why do you think sort of elite media and and now even politicians really sort of ignore um, the value of black lives when they are taken by other black folk. I wonder that all the time. Um, cynically, I think politicians uh, may gain votes from it. Um, the city council people around where I live in Northwest Queens um, aren't at great risk of violent crime. Um, and they can vote for defund and think they're on the right side of history. It's a civil rights issue. Um, and uh, I don't know, can compensate for having no black friends or something by saying we're, 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 we're with you on this one. Um, that's the cynic in me. I, uh, some I, academics, some of them may believe it. I don't know. Um, I was, I had a discussion uh, um, like July of last year with a Princeton professor who was talking about defund and alternatives to policing in Brownsville and in East New York. And I said, I said, chief, I didn't say chief. Uh, why don't you start, why don't you do it in Princeton first? You've got a disproportionately rich white community with a lot of money and no violent crime, basically. Why don't you go for the low hanging fruit first? Mm -hmm. um, well, why are you going to impose this experiment on others? It wouldn't pass IRB approval, you know, it was a human subjects committee approval. Um, picks, let's let's see it work, and then and then you can impose it on other people. And that was kind of, kind of the end of our conversation. <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess because they don't. I think it's because they don't have that. They, yeah, maybe. I think you might hit the, you might have hit the nail on the head. They don't know what crime is like, mm. the trauma that comes from it. And that kind of that that impact that it it's hard to it's hard to work on improving the community of gunshots are go are going off, um, you know it's a necessary but not sufficient uh, part to improve um, neighborhood societies is people need a just a level of public safety, um, you know but you know some of it comes down to and I think it's important you you, you mentioned it earlier, um, I think people. I, I used to say this more, I, not that I believe it less, I just don't say it as much. Too many cops are dicks. Um, the rude cop is a real problem because when right. a cop is rude to someone right. who is not used to being treated rudely and right. does not deserve to be treated rudely right. on top of that, they go, if they treat me like that, imagine how they treat a real criminal. You know what? Exactly right. the same way. They're not making a distinction. Right. They treat everyone as rude. Um, that I think is strangely a very major issue. And, and, and if you could improve that level of, uh, of customer service, just, I mean, it's, it's politeness. You're, you're right. You're exactly right. That, that's exactly what it is, you know, um, is that we don't, when you, when you don't have an officer in the community that can relate to the community, you know, I mean, I, I it just isn't an issue. Because of course the officer would be, uh, polite. Of course, the officer would be uh, motivated to do his or her, her job because they see themselves in people they're serving. When you lose that, it almost becomes um, like the attitude of uh, peacekeeping missions that have been on in the military, where we're an uh, army of occupation. These people don't want us here. They're all the same. This whole neighborhood, every, they, they can't find anything worth protecting in the neighborhood. If it's all about making arrests, if it's all about, you know, finding something, then they're missing out on what I feel the real role of a police officer should be and what the role of a police officer is in affluent communities. They are an integral part of the community and valued as them. Yes, actually, uh, I might still be able to do it by phone. I could call it in right now if you like. Monument in port, no problem. <laughs> they got great wings there, I'm telling you. Literally, they have. To, there's a spot there that sells chicken wings so good. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's something akin to like a, a 12 o'clock truce 
you know, the dealers and the cops would go in, line up, get their wings, come out, eat, and, you know, everyone goes back to work. Really? Our robbers got to eat, too. But but the, uh, but the, I, the, I think that's another dimension of this too, is that the the framing, um, and a lot of the the literature is on sort of the war drugs and and thinking that all of this is because um, police are picking up sort of some young brown or black kid who you know is caught with a few ounces of weed on them and 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 you know why are we even policing drugs this way at all and sort of if we just sort of do away with that then we'll be all good the problem of course is that that's not really the the danger of these communities right it's 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 the homicides it is the violence um and it's not that you know people people are not necessarily although you know older people may call in people who maybe smoke weed on their stoop or outside their window but for the most part people want the end to the shooting to the violence to the death and i think if there was more understanding of the the death the feel of crime um i think we would have a better policy conversation about what we should be doing about it well, that's that's exactly what's needed i mean what we need is uh we don't need more clergy in the pulpit we don't need more politicians on the podium we need more policymakers and patrol cars yeah. okay on a friday right. night that's right on monument street in right. baltimore and places right. like that where they can actually see what's going on they can actually right. see the dysfunction um when you talk about defunding the police well who are people going to call when the kids don't go to school when there's a domestic when um you know uh junior's not taking his medication i've handled all those calls and the difference is uh, the approach when you are doing it from a perspective of providing a service rather than being an occupied territory. You know, so what did you, you do about cops hate getting them? My kid won't go to school. Call. Well, how did you deal? I with mean, it? you know, well, I, this was this was pre um, body cam, um, so there were you had options. Okay, you had <laughs> you had a lot of options. Uh, one of them would be, um, and again, I, I found myself as a, a more or less uh, a male figure, right? Like I'm, I'm a, stand, a father figure, and it's pretty much rent a dad. Nine one one, you get an officer who you know to come in, and uh, you can make him go to school because he doesn't want to deal with you because he knows that they, they have access to you and you'll come in and straighten things out. And if he doesn't want to see you again, then he's going to go to school or do whatever. But again, you have to have this sort of relationship with the people that you're working with. If you don't care one way or the other, they're not going to call. But this is, I think, where some of the defund conversation could be slightly useful. And that is, I think, part of the issue here um, is the lack of a ro robust civil society um, to provide those services to the community, right? Strong civic and religious institutions, community organizations um, that, are, that are needed not to, you know, fight violent crime, but to provide the kind of services, mentoring, um, other types of, of, you know, in respond to other types of issues that, that, that don't require an armed agent of the state um, to intervene. And so I do think if we can, now we may or may not need to, you know, take money from police budgets to do that, but the more we can, I think, empower communities um, and invest in um, these communities and uh, the civil society of these communities to solve a lot of these other problems, these social problems on their own terms, I think that will sort of ease up some of the pressure and resources. You know, in, in theory, Michael, but, you know, my um, my sociology bullshit detector just went off, not on high, but on low. Um, empower communities. Oh, we love empowering communities. Tell me what the hell that right. means. Look, it goes back to the example of, you know, if if, you know, a mother is having an issue with her son, um, there's no reason why she should be calling 911 
there's no reason why um, a police officer um, should be providing um, any kind of service in, in that kind of context. And so the extent to which we can have um, community organizations or community leaders, churches, whatever, be um, respond in those situations where that person won't need to come in contact with law enforcement in any way. I don't see why that's a, a bad idea. Um, again, I'm not saying that that's a solution for the crime problem per se, or the, the violence problem. But I do think having healthier communities um, is good on its own terms. It might yield benefits on um, the policing side by giving residents sort of other resources to handle sort of nonviolent issues. Yeah, it might. You know what? I, I, I'm not against that idea. Professionally, it's not my field. You know, I focus right. on the policing right. side, so I leave that to others. But so I'm waiting. We'll know that when that works, That's, the second people start call, the second people stop calling police, that'll be great for these things. Set up those systems. Um, but I don't see any of that happening. It's the do only that. words. Where's the money going to come from? This, that's, and that's the well, issue. It doesn't have that's to come from the 5% I, I of the budget that's policing. Listen to people. They talk about, oh, you know, I mean, I've lived in Europe. I've lived in Europe mm. like 14 years in different countries. And people will look to, uh, you know, police forces and uh the Nordic countries, for instance, the professionalism, all this. And I'm like, well, yeah, because they've got social programs that work. You know, it's not done based on a tax base. So, for instance, um, I live in Montgomery County, Maryland. Uh, you don't have those problems here, except in very small, isolated pockets. So it's really not an issue. Uh, the, P the police officers, they get the best training. The forces that get the best candidates because they can pay the best salaries are the ones that have the least problems. So these are issues that the officer in you know in my neighborhood could not handle at all because he's never done it. And it's the sort of thing that you know you're on the street maybe your first month in Baltimore you've handled ten or twenty uh, social worker calls. It just it's just part of the job. That's that's the job as you understand it is dealing with the minutia of daily life that people can't handle themselves because they're ill-equipped to deal with it. I would also say, yeah, that I, I don't, I think people don't give police enough credit that it's kind of amazing how well most cops handle most of these situations. Um, simply from that experience, simply because no one else is coming. Um, what I don't understand is this magic social worker. I mean, <laughs> but, but they, they know the de-escalation dap that's going to make everything nice like what what do they have that i mean and, and they, this is a sincere question i'm making it sound rhetorical but what the hell do they have the cops don't um some people say well the simple fact is they don't have a gun they're not bringing a gun on the scene and uh, okay is that really what it's all about in a society with you know hundreds of millions of guns because a lot of those social workers are going to be calling for a cop with a gun because they don't because <laughs> it's america right. Right. So, but uh, uh, look, I, I don't sort of, I don't disagree with your skepticism. And I think we need a lot more evidence to sort of figure out, you know, whether, you know, certain types of strategies um, will actually work here. But what I'm saying is, is, is not the standard, you know, instead of calling the police call a social worker issue, what I'm saying is um, that we need a healthy community issue uh, and, and that a, a lot of problems, um, you know, are connected to um, what Rob Sampson calls sort of the social organization of these communities and repairing those relationships, having sort of um, more, you know, communities that are sort of more rich in social capital that can communicate and, um, and can, uh, I think, regulate itself and, and deal with problems on their own, um, I think is a goal that we should strive. I, I um, agree, but towards. let me play devil's advocate. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let me, do you... Uh, is it an unfair burden to say this is a community problem? You know what? I don't know everyone who lives on my block. If there's some problem, I want to call 911 and have cops deal with it. If someone shoots someone on my block, that's not my community. Um, this idea of sort of it's almost like collective responsibility for individual problems in a community that is already struggling and doesn't have enough resources. And now we're saying you have to solve the violence problem too? So, so, wait, wait, hold, so I'm, not saying, I'm not saying solve the violence problem. Okay. Right. I, again, I'm sort of distinguishing between, you know, sort of categories of 
of, of things that um, police officers currently deal with that they may not need to deal with. Um, and again, going by the example of the mother who may call um, upon a cop to, to solve a problem that doesn't require a cop cop to solve that could be solved by having more community resources that's what I, all i'm so, talking so that about. no call happens i mean the same thing right. that, exactly once exactly. somebody is in crisis be that right. mental health right you know physical right it's too late um right. then it doesn't right. matter who you call though idea right. is you have to right you have to get to the problem at right. the front right. of the system so that right. people stay on their right. meds so that right. the mother has the resources you know so the daughter goes to school kind of stuff right. um I, I would love it i would love a more european model on that uh, I just don't, I don't understand what that has to do with police, quite frankly. We saw that, we saw that in the, um, in the Bryant shooting. You know, we saw the, the exact same thing. And there was this outroar from, from, uh, you know, the, the abolitionist community at large. You know, as soon as we get justice, they shoot someone else. Well, I'll tell you, how, how do you deescalate, you know, um, a girl swinging a knife at someone else? So this is, the, this is the shooting in um, Toledo, bit, Ohio you're talking about, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's gone a bit far at that point. And at that point, uh, to say Black Lives Matter, well, yeah, there's two Black lives here, okay? There's one Black life that's clearly in jeopardy. And if I, as an officer, if I take the time to, to, you know, to think about the optics of the situation, if I study whether or not I've got qualified immunity, um, how this is going to play out for my career. Do Am I actually doing police work? Or am I involved in self-preservation? And, you know, the only thing you heard on, you know, social media and various outlets was police shoot 15-year-old Black girl. What about police save the life of the woman who was also Black that she was swinging the knife at? And okay, this I, is the dilemma. I mean, that we literally saw the crux of this entire dilemma immediately after the Chauvin verdict. We saw it, and it played out as it plays out time and time again. What what happened with that Bryant shooting literally is the additional hundred people per year that have died in Baltimore City since Freddie Gray's accidental death, except that it was caught on on camera. And even then, as a as a police officer saved the life of a black citizen, which unfortunately was came at the expense of another black life, the public wasn't satisfied. That was a, I, I, from a theoretical standpoint, I find that a, I don't like to call shootings useful, but it is useful because it, it frames the debate nicely. This was not a case of, I feared for my life. This was not a case of, I thought he had a gun. Um, a woman, it wasn't just that she was welding a knife, a girl, she was actively in the motion of about to stab someone and probably kill her, at least severely hurt her. Um, it's straight out of a shoot, don't shoot training scenario. If we don't but, want- but, but, but it's also an example of, of um, what happens when society fails a young woman <laughs> of yes. color over and Absolutely. over and over again. And so for me, that's what, so what I say, you know, strengthening civil society, um, that's what I'm talking about, of, of, of having kind of safeguards and, and remedies um, that don't rely on the police before, you know, situations get to that point. I agree with you. Once well, give me some specifics. Called, give me, so, you know, if you were, if you were king for a day, King Fortner has a nice ring to it. Um, okay, what, what what do we do? What do we do in terms of investing? Yeah, give, give, give me something that's not just lip service. Give me some concrete, vague policy proposals. <laughs> right, so look, I think, you know, investing more in um, violent interrupters may be um, an, an option of, of, of having more resources um, around individuals who can talk to people who may or may not be engaging in, in violence um, and calm them down and figure out what kind of um, resources that they need and find a way to direct resources to, to them. I think sort of uh, at least um, experimenting more with that and providing, expanding that capacity to see if it yields results um, is sort of one thing we could we could definitely do now. You know, there's one essay from a uh... Devone um, on my site, who's a violence interrupter in Stockton, uh, California, um, which is, I think, worth 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 reading. Um, one of the, uh, Devone Bogan um, is his name. And one of the things interesting talking about people who have that contact with the street is 
Um, we initially met because somebody, a third party, thought we we're going to be an opposite size of policing issues. Mm. Um, and we weren't because we both... <laughs> Uh, we both kind of understood what was going on in the world. Um, and, you know, I still haven't met him in person. I wouldn't say we're buddy, buddy, but anyway, we, you know, we've, right. we've, we've interact, you know, we've been interacted a few times and he contributed to this project. Um, I don't see our goals at all as mutually exclusive. Um, I do think a little bit too much faith is done on violence interrupters. Um, there've been problems in Baltimore with criminal, uh, activity, um, at an abstract level, and I'm willing to sacrifice this if it works, I don't care about the abstract problem. I, have. I do find something odd about people saying we need more police legitimacy and then setting up parallel structures that are specifically designed to sort of not interact or encourage police legitimacy. But that I can, that's, I, I could give that up for, for practical benefits. I also though wonder, I mean, there has been some research. It's not strong. It's hard to scale those up because so the, much- Right, so look, I, so I, I'm sympathetic. So I, yeah. I, I, I think I'm sympathetic to that. Although I think this is an opportunity that we could sort of, um, you know, gather more evidence. I mean, I, part of what's difficult, I think in this conversation is that we don't have sufficient evidence to see how, you know, these alternative measures actually work and how they, and whether or not they work scaled um, at a certain level. Um, but for me, that that's not a reason not to try to invest um, try or, or, and, 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 and to sort of see and measure, you know, what's going on. But I mean, but, but for you, I, so a question for you, right? But what, one of the things that comes up in these debates is, is, the inability of police officers to actually fix these problems. And so wh why do you have um, faith at, you know, in police as a remedy for violence? Uh, partly that goes back, you made an allusion to um, the sort of a the attitude in academia that police and crime aren't related. Mm. Um, and that goes back to people like David Bailey and Michael Tonroy and, and Peter Manning even. Um, and I went into this field in part because of, I, I read those, that line of debate that police don't prevent crime. Um, and it's a myth and we sociologists know this secretly. It goes back to the 68 Kerner Commission, the Presidential Commission on Crime in large part. Um, and we're still sort of debating that today, uh, you know, 50 plus years later. Um, I just said, of course, police matter good or bad, like this idea that it's just an illusion and that everything's because of root causes in society. I said, I, you know, I don't buy that. And it, I entered grad school in 95, murders in New York were in the process of plummeting. Everyone said it couldn't happen. It wasn't happening. It won't continue to happen. Um, and a lot of that happened from policing. Um, so I said, I mean, I, if everyone in this field is wrong, if the experts are wrong, it's probably a good field to get into. And that's kind of how I picked the policing angle. Um, I knew I wanted to study something urban because I'm a city boy. Uh, so I got into it for that reason. Um, my first police research started actually in Amsterdam. So I saw a model of policing that is different. I wouldn't say it's fun, you know, it's not fundamentally different, but it's a very, it's a different model of policing. Um, and I had that experience as a researcher before I became a cop in Baltimore. So I knew, um, there was another way. Um, the idea, I mean, so I, yeah, at my core, I believe policing can prevent violence. I'm not going to say anything, you know, I don't go beyond that, but that's enough. We can pick our little niches in the world and trying to make the world a better place. If through my, you know, 20 but, years but, ago. But do, but, but, but do police prevent violence better than something else? So, because uh, that's. A, yeah, I, 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 better, I, you know, I, I avoid the word better. Right. Um, more effectively than other things, because that's uh, that's the other part of this debate, right? That yeah. it's that okay, even if we accept that police may prevent violence, uh, the question is, uh, can they do it more effectively than other remedies, and can they do it with less other less fewer sort of social costs um, than than other yeah. remedies? You know, I don't my 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 inclination is to say yes, uh, but I don't know. Um, the point is, I want to see these other <laughs> these other solutions. I know that policing can work. I don't know about these other things, okay. and they're often not mutually exclusive. We can do both, and um, but I don't think it can happen without policing. You know, one of the little we don't have to fix society to have safer streets. Um, I'm just well, you know, and and that doesn't mean that poverty and racism are not important. They might be more important, uh, but it's you know professionally, it's not what I deal with. Um, in New York City, when murders went down 70% in the 1990s, poverty actually increased. Um, that's not good. I don't think that's why murders went down, by the way. But poverty went up. 
Uh, and so we were able to make safer streets without fixing society. I think that's good enough. Um, and I'm afraid that if we focus too much on what sociologists call the root causes, um, we're gonna end up fixing nothing. And in fact, go backwards uh, because we're saying that policing are not, don't have to be part of the solution. Um, so I'm not disagreeing with you, but I just, I, I, I don't like that it's phrased as an alternative to policing, I guess. I want it in addition to. Liam, what were you gonna say? Well, I mean, I think that what's, what's necessary is to have officers who have an understanding of the community they serve. You know, we tend to look at police as a, this generic entity. Um, I kind of, uh, you know, when I talk to people that uh, are from, you know, other countries, friends back in Europe, some of whom are actually doing the job, I tell them that here in the States, uh, police are either here to protect everything the system has afforded you or uh, keep you from acquiring through illegal means everything the system has denied you. And, you know, this is how people see it. Uh, there's, there's a totally different uh, view of law enforcement where I live now uh, compared to where I grew up, yet I'm the same person. Mm. So, you know, I, yeah, do I belong here in Montgomery County, one of the richest counties in the country? Yeah, but I also belong in East Baltimore. That's home. You know, me as a person, I haven't changed. Yet my interactions with the police in both of those areas will be vastly different because of the way I'm perceived. So why do you think, to both of you, why aren't we having a, a police and conversation? Um, it, it would seem to me that that would be an easier conversation to have rather than a uh, police or conversation. Um, and so what, what's, what's shaping this debate? Some of it, and this is not a complete answer, I, but I think it gets short shrift too much of the time. Some of it, I think, is a class thing, a class divide that's growing mm -hmm. um, as uh, much of America becomes more white collar professional and policing is, with some exceptions, is still fundamentally a, a blue collar job. In New York, um, it's a lot of immigrants and kids of immigrants basically trying to break into America's working class. Um, so I think there's a both a race and class segregation issue that means people don't understand cops. Mm. Uh, and when I say people, that, I don't mean all people. I mean, right. people who don't have any, not only don't they know any cops, they don't know anybody who does. Right. Um, you know, if you go to a hospital ER, you know, the nurses and cops are, you know, often very, you know, of the same background and class. So I just want to throw that out there. I think that's part of it. Um, and then, you know, it's an easy group to be against if, uh, Especially in the, you know, cops often are their own worst enemies when you get, uh, you know, the, you, and Baltimore's got a better union uh, head than New York. So I don't even want to group all police unions, but boy, police unions say some stupid things and it's bad, you know, it's bad for their membership um, along, you know, you, you know, you just get the, the Trump apologists and so on. Um, that certainly doesn't help the cause. I mean, it is a conservative institution. Um, hell, Leon moved to a conservative neighborhood. I guess he missed policing so much. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I will I will say this. The last time I got stopped by uh, my local police department, they called for backup once they found out I was from Baltimore City. So, yeah, there is <laughs> wow. wow. Yes. Yes. Wow. You see, when you're when you're black, that thin blue line, it gets right. pretty damn thin. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. So Peter, why do we? So why do we have? And, and I get this question a lot. Um, why did? Why do we have these uprisings, these revolts against police? If 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 they are a, a, a in general a good for society, um, what explains the 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 rebellion in the streets against policing? I think it depends can on I, who. Can I yeah, answer go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't think it's against the police. Mm. I think the police are the only uh, simply represent the the system, the government, the local government. The police are the only ones that are coming. Okay, social workers aren't coming, educators aren't coming. The only people that are coming are the people that you know first responders when you dial nine one one. So we become a proxy for everything that's wrong in the community. That's why you know you can't beat city hall, mm -hmm. but you can throw a brick at police. Wow! Wow! 
Um, I also think there's an element in addition to that. Uh, I mean, it depends on who's there, of course. Sometimes it's a, it's a party. Sometimes it's fun. Uh, there's that element as well. Um, sometimes I think it's a way to, you know, it dep- you know, is it, is it people in a neighborhood pissed off at the way they've been treating, or is it people from other, you know, outlying suburbs coming in to make sort of a political point? I think there's a different element to to all of that. Um, you know, sometimes it's just a peaceful assembly. Uh, yeah, and then police show up because no one else does, and suddenly, suddenly bottles are thrown. Um, but I don't know. What what what's your take, Michael? You're the you're the only real sociologist here. I just a political scientist. Um, <laughs> no, I'm politi- sorry. Political scientist. Give me a political uh, science perspective. I guess I'm the only real sociologist. Yeah, you are. The- <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean I I I get this question a lot um, because people say because I, I, again I tell this story where if you if you um, you know look at survey evidence and you sort of look at um, sort of black newspapers during the 60s and 70s and, and even later, you see uh, this huge well of support from policing. And it's not that there aren't criticisms. Um, they, again, they oppose police brutality um, and they, um, you know, they hate when cops are ru- rude, but they do see police as part of the solution for the problems in their community. And in fact, they're, they tend to be um, for the most of the period that I studied, much more concerned about violence and drugs than they are about the police. Um, and so, but then people say, but wait a second, we, we know that there are all these, and, you know, and historians like to say, we know that there are these all these riots against police brutality. Um, doesn't that suggest that they're not, um, um, you know, that they're not happy with police and policing in their communities? And my response is kind of like your response is that, they are complicated events, and it's and it's very difficult to um, derive from this sort of complicated event one black perspective when there could be different moments in that event that represents different perspectives, right? It's quite plausible that in that you know at the because a police might have killed someone, you have in the street a variety of people who are sympathetic to the family, who are concerned about violence, um, but still feel as if the police are an important presence in these communities. Um, you could also have in that crowd individuals who think police are um, the enemy uh, and don't want them in the community. Uh, and then later on, they could turn it to something else. And so I, I'm with you in that I think we ought to be um, analytically careful um, by reducing these complex events down to sort of one um, causal story and to, and to one Black perspective, because it's, it's, it's really not. Do you think it's relevant that the, let me say it's a weird concept, the mainstream far left narrative uh, used to be Marxist. Um, I understood it didn't really agree with it, but there's a lot of validity to it. But, you know, class-based, um, proletariat, bourgeoisie, the whole, the whole Marxist line. That has shifted um, to race-based. Um, and it's interesting that some of the more vehement and intelligent opposition to say critical race theory comes from, you know, the, the three dozen people still actively involved in the far left Marxist movement in America. Adolf Reed and, and some other really smart people. Yeah, um, but I wonder if that shift is somehow relevant here, but I don't quite know how. Look at that. See, I put on a sociologist hat for like 10 seconds there. Um, but I think that might have to do with it. In a way, race maybe is easier for other for a lot of people to understand in America than class. So it is. So I think that, look, I'm, I am befuddled by this question because it's not just that people have turned to race-based explanations more than class explanations, but they, they've come to see certain class explanations as conservative, as sort of dangerous almost. Um, and, I, you know, and, I, and I still don't understand how that has happened. Um, oh, and, it's, and I think it's a recent phenomenon. Again, you had, you know, Bill Wilson and others talking about class in very interesting and important ways um, in the 1980s and in the early 1990s. And that kind of thinking seems to be sort of dangerous now um, and, and a lot of, of places. And I think that does, um, I, I think it is rooted, and I could only 
I think my hypothesis here is only about sort of white um, intellectual elites and, and some political elites, is I, I don't think they have enough ex experience with working class poor white or, or working class poor black and brown folk. Um, and I think they, they understand race academically um, or they are around and uh, have as friends sort of black professionals. And so they don't understand the complexities of these communities. Let they me don't go understand. a step further and say, if one could ignore race, I don't think there's any more diverse community than East Baltimore right. Um, right. or any so-called ghetto. Right. Uh, there is a diversity there in thought, political right. I ideology, right. income, right. in everything, professional status that you won't see right. anywhere else. Since a lot of that, I think, you know, is a legacy of historic segregation because right. everyone got thrown in the same neighborhood, basically. Right. Um, but my God, there's a lot of diversity there. Right. And for people to just say, to, to essentialize it by race, um, I mean, no one who has spent any time in that neighborhood, well, I want to say no one, because probably some cops do, still don't see it. Uh, but you, you don't have to spend a lot of time in, in certain neighbors to see that diversity, um, you know, between the church leaders. You know, I don't know about you, Leon. Um, I'm curious, I, you know, when you arrest a juvenile, you're stuck with them for hours. Um, and being a Harvard sociologist at the time, I, and just being naturally inquisitive, I would talk to them, the kids. Um, I would ask them questions like, have you ever been outside of Baltimore? You know, have you ever been outside of East Baltimore? Often, by the way, the answer was no. Well, I visited, you know, I got auntie on the west side, um, but their entire life was five blocks. And a five block radius was not a good, I mean, it, 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 that, that's a, quite a worldview to have. Um, I would also, I can, you, go, you ever been to church? I'm not really religious myself. Not a single kid I arrested went to church. I don't quite, you know, I'll leave that, what that means for others. But, um, you know, there's a, there are many different worlds going on there is, 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 is my only point. And, and just to agree with you, people don't see that. But you even said, um, you know, did you go to church? Like most white intellectuals would never ask that question, <laughs> would never dawn on someone that that would be a, an important question to, to raise or that might clarify something um, that's that's going on. I mean, one of the biggest things I think for me is that um, and again, and, and, you know, these are people who I spend most of my my life with um, is that sort of most white political intellectual elites probably have never been in a home where people say grace over dinner. Right. And small things like that. I think really blind would blind you to the all the ideological and cultural and socioeconomic diversity in these communities. Um, and so I think I, that, I, I'm laughing, that, Michael, because I went to a church where they, you know, pulled the plywood up over the baptismal <laughs> bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> so look, you you know a lot more than than a, than a, than a lot of, of of white folks. Right, and I was in, invited in, there right. by a guy I went to the right. academy with. By the way, right, I mean, that's, yeah, right, right. I mean, there's there's things um, that <laughs> people just don't understand. I mean, yeah. if you look at a city like Baltimore, you know, you had the great migration from the south, um, and that brought a lot of the southern Moors and you know the the community. OK, I, I grew up in the 70s in Baltimore and I can tell you, um, I was not worried about Officer Moscow's. I was worried about Ms. Fortner because if Ms. Fortner caught me on the schoolyard and told me, you know, stop trespassing. Was I going to curse her out? No. Right. Right. All right. Because if I did, <laughs> by the time the streetlights right. came on. Right. OK. Right. And I went up on the porch. The screen door was locked. Michael's mother was sitting there drinking coffee mm. with mine, <laughs> and I got my ass tore That's up right, in right. front of your mother. Right. So, right. you know, that that adage that uh, I guess has become vogue again, it takes a village. That's all we knew. The police never had to get involved with a lot of stuff. You know, it just it just wasn't a thing because you had that shared experience and shared values. Now, you introduce drugs into a community, right, right. Um, mass incarceration. You take away those uh, those community leaders or the male figures. Um, it, it happens. It's it's not that, that that much of a stretch to see uh, the social issues that can befall a community. But the real problem is when you have officers who don't understand that, and they police as if you know it's all things are equal. So if, if you're engaged in some activity or if you're in this community, you must be guilty of something. That's when the community starts revolting. 
because that's not the case at all. So we need need more cops to, you know, read W. E. B. Du Bois and talking about Philadelphia and like how do you how do you get that? Now let me and, also and, say, you know, Leon, you know as well as I do that some of the most um let me just say harsh cops can be cops from that neighborhood because they take things personally. True. Now are they just whooping the right ass? Is that the difference? Or, you know, there, it kind of, there's a, it's a double-edged sword there where you, you want people who understand the neighborhood. You don't want people who are taking revenge from getting beat up in, you know, high school either. This is, this is true. This is, this is true. Um, but there has to be an understanding. I mean, w- one thing that I would do if, you know, if it was left with me, I would totally get rid of community policing. Totally. Just disband it. Okay. And the reason being is we don't have community policing in this na- the neighborhood that I currently live in because every officer is seen as part of the community. They have an obligation to understand the community they serve. Why, why that doesn't work you know, in urban areas, I don't know. But it seems as if you have to have a specialized unit. And when you have that, it takes all the responsibility off the patrol officers to engage with the public at large. So you don't know this person other than when he's whipping somebody's ass, pointing the gun at him, or putting the cuffs on him. You don't know who the hell that is. He's just the police. He has no name. He has no personality. You've never seen him laugh with kids or talk to old people or whatever. Never seen that part of him. He's simply the police. Can you have community policing with the war on drugs? I... I... Don't know how much is, is that. Okay, as long as the war up? on drugs stays a war on drugs, okay. When it's a war on people in drug infested communities, then yeah, then you have issues, okay. Let the war on drugs be a real war on drugs. Hmm. Stop them at the source. But of course, now we're getting into geopolitics, and we know that's not going to happen. So you know, our country's inundated, and our our communities are inundated with drugs because everything here is done on the tax base. Those areas that have um, the, the financial means for the people to have a drug problem and get private health because they have insurance and you know the funds to do so, they will do it. I can't, t- right now, I can't tell you how many of my neighbors are snorting coke right now, okay? But it's not an issue because if they want to, they can pay for treatment. If they don't, they can pay for coke. They don't have to commit crimes. That's not the case where I'm from. New York, there's another problem that people from a uh, uh, woman from Cumberland, Maryland, you know, was was involved in a murder and then was in a tent and on Broadway on the Upper West Side. Anyway, it was an interesting little story. Um, but it's a magnet when you have, I mean, this local tax base issue, New York should not be paying for the problems from rural Pennsylvania and Maryland. Um, and poor communities need a way to pay for things. I mean, that, that might be the root of the problem is our tax base is all local. So yeah, schools, courts, police, everything. That, that's, Rich- that's the thing. I mean, you, you can't, you can't pull the responsibilities. You can't, uh, you know, say I'm going to defund police without first having an understanding of what police do in that community. Okay. What police do, they do less counseling here be- where I live because it's not needed. So you really don't need a police to come in and, you know, uh, give you be a referral agency or or whatever. You know, you don't you don't need that. You don't need wraparound services because everyone here's got a computer. And if I want to know how to deal with my kid's drug problem or truancy problem or whatever, I go online and that's what I do. You know, but too many of these pro- these programs, we throw out a generic situation as if it's a one size fit all. And the 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 root of the matter is. No one in power wants to admit how absolutely fucked up things are, okay? <laughs> they don't want to do it. So, yes, they will tell you, oh, yes, we'll defund the police. You know, they're killing our kids. We're going to fix the problem. That's how you end up with 300 homicides every year in Baltimore City, as opposed to the, the already ridiculous 200. Mm-hmm. But no one's talking about that. Yeah. Um, we probably should wrap up because um, I know Michael's got to go, and we've been at this for about a little over an hour, which is always a good time to try and wrap things up. Um, 
Any closing thoughts, Michael? Feel free to say no. But. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just I'm just grateful to be in conversation with um, these two uh, brothers right here. This was uh, I, I benefited from this greatly, um, and I learned a lot. So thank you for having me. Yeah, I mean we should um, you know do this again in a couple months when we have some other stuff to talk about. So um, I'm Peter Moskos. I'm here with Leon Taylor and Michael Fortner. Uh, this is Quality Policing. Um, you can read more at QualityPolicing.com. And um, thank you all for listening. And thank you. um, Thank you for being here, Michael. Thank you.